decision making in hsv graphs first decision we need to make is the diagnosis which is largely clinical in the early stage in the first pre op picture we see the imprint of the scarred dendrite Another patient shows bilateral scarring with vascularization which is most commonly associated with healed HSV keratitis. But we do come across atypical presentations preoperatively. This shows the presence of steel wool keratopathy. If it is in the periphery, the diagnosis could lean more towards healed autoimmune disease, but central involvement is more likely to be healed HSV. This patient surprisingly had numular corneal scars in the fellow eye which looked like adenoviral keratitis. The next picture shows a healed marginal keratitis. This may look like staphylococcal immune disease, but staphylococcal marginal keratitis will have an associated dry blepharitis with a mild perilimbal immune infiltrate, whereas HSV marginal ulcer is a primary infectious disease and not a reaction. Here, the lid is inflamed and can be associated with discharge, which is not seen in staph immune disease. And the peripheral ulcer in HSV is also quite aggressive. This is the primary form of HSV and it is important to distinguish between these two as our treatment depends on it. Steroids are usually the first line of management for staph immune disease whereas use of steroids it can flare up HSV blepharokeratoconjunctivitis where the treatment is antiviral agents. The next decision to make is whether keratoplasty is absolutely required in patients with post hepatic eye disease because it is best avoided in these eyes. The picture shows us a very mild scar not affecting the vision so it is best left alone. Second one, the scar is less prominent but there is a significant cataract which would require to be treated. The patient underwent a cataract surgery and the post operative picture shows that the patient did well. Patches of iris atrophy can be seen which is indicative of a post healed hepatic keratouveitis. This shows a diffuse nebulomacular scar but the architecture of the iris and the pupil can still be seen clearly which implies that the patient can also see through that cornea but with a lot of distortion and glare in this case the use of a contact lens would come in handy so many of these patients can be fitted properly with pros lenses we know that keratitis invites vascularization and vascularization in which lip, uh, lipid keratopathy is seen here this can be treated with fine needle diatomy about which we will be speaking on later in the next picture we see that both the lipid and vessels have regressed leaving behind some scars however when the patient comes with a large stromal necrotic keratitis or with a small central or a bigger scar with vascularization obscuring vision then keratoplasty becomes compulsory coming to pre operative considerations Preoperatively, it is important to know the layers of involvement and this is best done in the acute stage. This shows the first patient with diffuse involvement of the cornea. However, slit examination shows that the only anterior stroma is involved. By contrast, the next patient has only a central involvement, but the stromal involvement and in edema can be seen in the slit picture. In these cases, an ASOCT helps us to delineate specific layers of involvement. Based on this delineation, a decision can be taken about whether to proceed with a DALC or EK or PK. The eye needs to be quiet before surgery in HSV grafts. This shows a scar with vascularization, but on staining, we found fluorescent stippling of the epithelium. These can either be bits of healing dendrites or surface irregularity over the scars. Either way, the eye is not yet ready for keratoplasty. There are instances where patients may present with atypical features of herpetic keratitis. First is that of a patient with dry eye, where there is a presence of subtarsal fibrosis which may mimic other cicatrizing diseases. Another patient who came with scar with BSK which is unusual for HSV keratitis. For only the presence of a scar, the eye looked a little inflamed. On staining, within the breakup of BSK, there was a dendrite hiding. So, the patient needed antiviral therapy to quieten the eye before surgery. Another picture shows the rare herpetic sclerokeratitis for which the patient needs to be on antiviral cover before and after. A patient presented with multiple recurrences and a scar with significant vascularization making it a high risk graft. So steroids may work in the inflammatory stage of the disease for vessels but only vaso occlusive treatment will work for fully formed vessels for which we use FND. The grid shows the start of vascularization, stromal whitening on the eye post FND, process of regression of vessels and then the completed compacted graft. The graft should be done 1 month after the procedure with inflammation under control but 3 to 4 months before recanalization of the vessel. 
cases can happen. So that window is very important for the graft which should be done with the help of an antiviral cover. Otherwise, it can have the recurrence of stromal necrotic infection. The cover can be with acyclovir or valacyclovir which has better bioavailability. Though some literature recommends one year if the patient is renal competent, the cover has to continue indefinitely because of lifelong latency of virus. Intraoperative Considerations it is important to take diagnostic samples of both tissue as well as aqueous and test for microbiological confirmation including PCR which may add value to the diagnosis. The picture in slit view shows a simple linear scar but on looking closely we see severe thinning in that area. Careless refination or suturing can lead to wound leaks in variable thickness of post hepatic scar. Here is a patient with multiple recurrences with scar and vascularization. But if we look at the pictures in the middle, we see there is a significant limbal stem cell deficiency. This is a patient with seroderma pigmentosa, but it is shown in the context that along with the graft, when there is a significant LSCD, we could do alloslet from the same donor when it is fresh. And since herpetic grafts are anyway high-risk grafts, the immunosuppressive cover which is given post-operatively will protect both the grafts. We can see that the surface is epithelized well in the post-operative period. Post-operative considerations the most common concern after corneal transplant after HSV keratitis is recurrence of epithelial dendrites. So here it should be remembered that anything which comes too soon is not a dendrite because corneal nerves have to grow back bringing with it the virus. So when it is very early it's most probably an epithelial disturbance. Secondly, something which is common across all these pictures is the epithelial defect straddling the graft host junction. This position of the epithelial defect especially staining with rose bengal should arouse suspicion of recurrent dendritic keratitis. This is a patient who has undergone DALG for post-hepatic scar and came with stromal recurrence. Patient was treated with maximum dose of oral antivirals and did not respond. Finally, we had to decapitate the DALG and then the scarring has happened. Both sets of pictures demonstrate that there is a recurrent epithelial dendrite and where the arrow points, it has gone on to involve the entire stroma. In unoperated patients, we seldom see the dendrite coexisting with stromal involvement. It is either one or the other. But in a post-operative situation, it must be remembered that when there is an epithelial recurrence, it can on its own spread to involve the stroma. We keep on talking about recurrence, but what is also important in herpetic grafts is rejection. Again, because these are high-risk grafts. Here is a patient who is showing what looks like a cododose line with stromal edema. If we watch very closely, we can see that the pigments and the KPs are also involving the host where the arrow is pointing. That cannot be rejection. So the patient was treated with antiviral agents. Any intraocular surgery, including cataract surgery, must also be covered with a maintenance dose of antiviral agents. And conservative approach would be to avoid procedures like LASIK or CXL, which could reactivate a dormant disease in post-herpetic eyes. Thank you. Thank you.